Whitman. I'm the chair of the uh, Digital Transformation. Sorry, let me just a second here. Okay. A Digital Transformation in Government Conference. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Guy Pierce and Christopher Yeomans to give a presentation on Rwanda, a digital transformation benchmark. Um, Guy Pierce is a member of the ISACA Emerging Trends Workshop, sorry, uh, working group. He's also an IT and governance, uh, data governance expert in the Government of Canada's International Technical Assistance Program. He's got extensive board experience and he has served as CEO, CIO, Chief uh, Digital Officer and Chief Data Officer all at the same time. So he's got a well-rounded approach to uh, digital transformation. We're absolutely delighted that he can present. And then there's Chris Yeomans, who's a leader in the international development sector, and he's worked in that for more than 25 years. He specializes in capacity development with a background as a results-based management, gender-based analysis plus individual triple nexus facilitator with the Center for Intercultural Learning. Chris serves as a project director for the Technical Assistant Program uh, at, uh, Gov at the Global Affairs Canada, and previously worked with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and it was a six-year municipal strengthening capacity development project in the Americas. Chris is multilingual, speaks English, French, and Spanish, and we're absolutely delighted to have them speak on this very interesting case study uh, about what's happened in Rwanda. So without further ado, uh, Chris, uh, Guy and Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wiseman. And on behalf of myself and of Christopher, thank you very much for having us at the fourth Digital Transformation in Government Conference. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is Rwanda as a digital transformation be benchmark, and hopefully uh, with a couple of lessons for Canada as well. Um, right. So we going to take a little bit of a journey. I'll introduce the country very briefly. We'll talk about the nature of the digital transformation journey that uh, Rwanda has gone through. Then uh, uh, Christopher will take over and he'll zoom into healthcare, into, into the healthcare uh, sector where we were on the ground in Rwanda and where we had some particular observations. And then we'll close with some potential learnings for Canada and Q&A. I mean, in a nutshell, the story is really for a really, really tiny country with hugely limited resources, it has achieved extraordinary digital outcomes. And what's been amazing, I think, from a firsthand observation perspective, is the fact that these achievements have been made in such a short time after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Uh, this is some of the story. And as I said, we'll do a little bit more of a deeper dive on the healthcare side. But uh, let us begin. I think for starters, uh, it's useful to define what we mean by global digital benchmark. And I'm very aware that there are many academics in the audience. So I just wanted to be clear, I'm not an academic. Um, but what really has allowed, I think, us to sort of get a sense that, wow, this is really potentially benchmark material, is if something is recognized as a reference point, and in this case, measuring digital advancement, that's certainly something that we see as the basis for, for actually qualifying as a benchmark. And of course, the other one is that it demonstrates quite significant achievements in the digital space. And I think, well, we think that Rwanda does both, but there's more. I mean, it's all fine because that's really, yeah, but it looks fabulous in its growth, but does it inspire? Does it make folks say, wow, that's quite a story? And ultimately, does it provide valuable insights for others as part of their own journeys? Because uh, if it doesn't excite and if it doesn't expire, yeah, then it's just an exercise and it's just something that folks read in a book. But the real thing, hopefully it inspires you as an audience as much as it did myself and Christopher. And uh, we hope to find that that is in fact true at the end of this presentation. All right, just very briefly, Rwanda, tiny, tiny, tiny country in the heart of Central East Africa. Neighboring countries are Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in the bottom left, you can see a comparative size of the uh, United States of America against Africa, just to give you a sense. It's a really big continent, uh, and Rwanda in turn, really tiny. Um, the land of a thousand hills, as, as it's called locally. 
Uh, just some uh, comparative views and the graph on the left is the most important here is having a look at the GDP per capita at purchasing power parity. In other words, that is, you, you might have heard of the Big Mac index. In other words, how much of your monthly earnings goes into being able to buy a Big Mac, a, a Big Mac across countries. So that's what your PPP basically is. And from this graph, you can see that Canada has 23 times the spending power of Rwanda. And this, will, this is really important when you come to relate to what Rwanda has achieved. And we'll see with very little resources where its spending power is just so much less. Um, from a population perspective, yep, tiny country and its population is about a third that of Canada. Right, so let's take you through the digital journey. Um, and if I may, uh, I think it's really important this presentation was vetted against um, uh, various communities in Rwanda. And that's really important because on the one hand, Rwanda's story is not really ours to tell in some sense. And it's useful to get, to get uh, uh, um, as I said, the various communities view that, yes, you, it's going with our blessing. So I think that's really important. And the messages you see here have got the blessing of, may I say, our client being the Ministry of Health in Rwanda as well as, in fact, Isaka Kigali, members, uh, the directors of Isaka Kigali, just for those of you as part of the Isaka community here. So let's take a quick look. So when did Canada's journey into digital start? And it just depends on who you are, but I decided let's start with the invention of the telephone out in Bell City, Brantford. You know, 150 odd years ago, I, you know, I would say if you talk about ICT, information and communication technology, the telephone is certainly really instrumental in that journey. And by 2010, the CRTC had declared high speed Internet as a basic service in Canada. Canada introduced the digital charter, charter in 2019. And of course, in 2020, digital transformation really rocketed forward with COVID and the response to uh, folks being under lockdown. By comparison, you've got Rwanda, um, who, as I try to study and determine, well, when did its digital journey start? I roughly find that 20, that 2000 is a good time to say its journey started from nothing. I mean, after the genocide and the, the, the infrastructure of the country was destroyed, it was starting from nothing. Um, and in 2000, what is now known as the University of Rwanda launched its computer science degree program. Around about 2011, it completed a fundamental aspect of its digital journey, which is the national fiber optic backbone, uh, which enabled fast inter uh, internet access around the country. And then really interestingly, at the same time Canada launched its digital charter, Rwanda uh, opened its national digital transformation center. And of course, from the journey from 2020, similar between Canada and Rwanda. And one of the most interesting things that I came across as part of doing my homework for Rwanda was this little quote. I am continuously amazed at how often digital is part of the national discourse. But not only that, that the news frequently highlights the digital innovations employed to tackle key development challenges. And I can attest to this quote, speaking to taxi drivers, to hotel staff, shopkeepers, wherever you are, folks keep talking about how technology has, has enabled them their lives. And I'll speak a little bit more of this at the moment. And yeah, that is, in fact, the one thing that, that come to mind is, well, what is, the, what is the influence of the nature of that national discourse being in things like increasing digital literacy, and such like, and the more accessibility, at least from a paradigm perspective of digital within the Rwanda national psyche. So yeah, you uh, sh straight after, uh, you know, when the leadership took over after the genocide, it was a matter of, well, what do we do now? How do we rebuild? And Rwanda faced numerous challenges. First of all, it's landlocked. Second of all, it's tiny. And then of course, in terms of raw materials in the primary sector, no oil, few mineral, uh, very little in the way of uh, natural resources with some attention to agriculture and tourism. So how do you build an economy when you're so constrained? And in fact, this whole story around how leadership shaped the conversation from here 
is, I think, worth an entire study all on its own. Given that the decision came, okay, we're constrained, we've got to get involved in high value products. Let's use technology to leapfrog the very same industrialization that first world countries have been through over the last 100 or 200 odd years. Let's get right over that. Let's uh, leapfrog that. But very importantly, to reject the divisionism that caused Rwanda to hit rock bottom. And this whole issue of national unity, again, you speak to taxi drivers, you speak to folks that don't speak about themselves being a member of a community, an ethnic community or whatever, I'm Rwandan, we are Rwandans. That is just the nature of the conversation, that whole sense of national unity. So what happened with all this? Let's leapfrog, we're all united, we need to move forward. And often in the conversations, as far as it comes to Rwanda, is it seen as the Singapore of Africa? And that is because Singapore itself developed from a poor country to really uh, a, a financial hub, if you want, even of Southeast Asia. Another emphasis has been on homegrown solutions. And this is really interesting when you speak about things like culture and that culture is not necessarily transferable across international borders, is there's an emphasis on homegrown solutions. And to quote the president, here are a couple of really key quotes. There are people here and there are ideas here. There are innovations we can generate from within to solve our problems. These innovations last and are more effective because they solve very particular problems. There's a full understanding of the context within the Rwandan environment. But there's more. If you look at the nature of government policy, it is so intertwined with the conversation of digital, it's almost as if they were molded out of the same block that the digital and the policy conversations are one and the same. But there's more. The emphasis on implementation is significant. When um, one of the folks from a linear, and Christopher will speak about how we ended up in Rwanda in a moment, and myself was speaking to the chief digital officer of the Minister of Health and said, why don't Rwandans talk about their successes? There's such amazing things going on here. They said two reasons. We feel we've been left behind because of the genocide. So we always feel like we're trying to fight to get ahead. And the second thing is that there's pressure to perform. And it's a really interesting one because it's not an undesirable pressure, it's a positive pressure. And a little bit later in this presentation, I will speak about potentially one of the learnings for Canada is the nature of government performance management and measurement as being instrumental in the rapid pace with which the digitalization journey has progressed. You know, I want you to say, oh, let me talk about one or two or three examples of digital transformation in Rwanda. The more I try, the more impossible it seems. I just so many examples you land at the airport you see it as you land it is just everywhere there is everything is digital and if i must choose a few let me choose the top three um so e-government and uh catherine luello was speaking of, obviously as the uh, uh uh cio of canada this morning on on, on e-government and directly from the united nations i quote the significant increase in national investment in online services provision has allowed the country to compete with the world's leading countries in e-government development. So that is one, uh, there's a whole lot more to go through. Let's talk about mobile money services. I was totally blown away and for the ISACA members in the audience, I met up with directors of the ISACA Kigali chapter. They took me out to dinner, they insisted on paying and I was blown away, you know, no credit cards, nothing, everything is on the phone. And I started inquiring, what were you doing on the phone? She said, I'm paying. And as I started investigating it, the whole country is about mobile money. It is, and in fact, you don't need a smartphone for mobile money. You can use 2G and USSD technology. You need no smartphone, but anyone with a telephone can be part of the financial system in Rwanda. And for years, you hear leaders of financial services industries. I was one. I was CEO of a, of a multinational financial services operation speak about how do we bank the unbanked? Here is a pure case where financial inclusion was there by design. Folks are part of the financial system. They're not left out because they don't have smartphones or they're not this or they're not that. It's just really part of the whole process. 
digital healthcare systems. Christopher will speak a little bit more about this in a moment. Uh, and then just so much more, whether it's uh, smart electricity grid, digital agriculture, Kigali Innovation City, biometric national identification, drone deliveries, digital entrepreneurship, so much and so much so and so much. Dr. Weissman, as I say, there's more than enough for you to investigate here if you wanted to. It is just does not stop. The more you read, the more this country in a short 20 years has achieved in my mind, if I may express it as bluntly, this is just a phenomenal journey towards the whole digitization of the national economy. So, you know, digital transformation is nothing. And that was a conversation. Uh, I think it's one that's happening right now, in fact, elsewhere in, 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 a, in, a, in a different channel. Is digital transformation means nothing if there's no outcomes. And I started to look at, well, what is the nature of the outcomes of the digital transformation journey in Rwanda? And here's a quick graph of GDP growth over the last 20 years. I don't think I need to explain that uptick there. So certainly uh, there could be a journey, but being, um, you know, I started to ask myself questions. Okay, but this could be a one-off. You know, what other countries maybe have got this sort of performance? So bear that in mind. I will come to that in a moment. And then I started looking elsewhere and just trying to find data. And sometimes it's quite hard to find data. And some of these are a little bit old. But certainly the graph on the left, the quality of life has been increasing since after the digital transformation journey. And on the right, in terms of the economic growth, you can see relative to its regional peers of similar size, it is outgrowing those. So certainly there's something to be said for digital transformation. But again, the question came to light is, okay, but still, this is maybe an exception. Can't I find something else that supports that there is a positive outcome for the economy by pursuing digital transformation. And I found this. So many may be familiar with uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is a huge, huge investment in building a trade infrastructure across 76 countries in Asia, Africa, and Europe. And there was a research paper for the academia amongst us here uh, the impact of digital economy on the economic growth and development strategies in the post COVID-19 era. And 31 countries in that study, just for starters, confirm, yes, digital economy has a significant impact on economic growth. So that's one. Second thing, it was just, so where does this growth come from? And certainly stimulated by industrial structure upgrading. So that's the infrastructure piece. But the fascinating piece of this conversation is the restructuring of employment. So many have been talking about the new world of work under digital. Here is the key thing is there's been a targeted approach to how do we reskill our citizenry and able to be able to participate in this new world of digital. So that, again, just a, all by itself is another whole area to study. Of course, as we know, COVID-19 boosted the demand for digital industries and for the economists amongst us, and I happened to have studied uh, economics at one point, although uh, I didn't become an economist, but there's two sides generally to an economic conversation around growth. One is your demand side economic growth and one is supply side economic growth. Supply side basically says, if you produce it, they will buy. Demand side is basically because you're demanding something, industry will set itself up in such a way that it can fulfill those requirements. The driver here has been demand side. If you've got countries along the Belt and Road channel and they need to engage in trade and everyone's got digital technology, you're going to want to get on board and demand that your country uh, grow its, dig its, its whole digital infrastructure and environment. So that's why it's very much been a demand side driver of the digital economy, in this case, as part of the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. But and then I sat back and said, okay, but there's a lot of things going on here, but what makes Rwanda special? And here's my six things about why I think Rwanda is a special case amongst, as a digital transformation practitioner, amongst the many cases that I've seen uh, during my short time on earth, as much as my hair color may say otherwise. The first was leadership. And I mentioned it on a previous slide, is what is the role of national leadership in prioritizing and focusing on initiatives. And as we learned in Rwanda here, when options are extremely limited, 
So that's the one thing you've got to give leadership credit. The second thing is economic integration. There was no issue about, oh, let's do digital transformation in education, or let's do digital transformation in government, or let's do digital transformation in healthcare. All of the pillars there, education, government, healthcare, agriculture, business, job creation, environment, infrastructure, smart girls as an initiative, and Kigali smart cities, all were created as an integrated strategy within Smart Rwanda. The big thing about that is it minimized silos. And listening to Catherine Luello again this morning, the one thing she was talking about was certainly, she didn't use the word silos, she had a different word of it, a word for it, but certainly that is a constraint generally in terms of how you integrate. Rwanda took a different approach. Let's start right at the beginning and ensure that our entire government structure is integrated on the same journey, on the same path. Infrastructure, I spoke about briefly. Of course, it's a critical success factor. What was interesting was the public-private partnerships. And uh, Catherine Luello, again, she spoke this morning about a couple of things. She spoke about the role of people in changing the culture of government. And she didn't use this word, but I use this word, citizen centricity. In other words, not just doing things in almost your supply side kind of approach, but your demand side kind of approach is what do the citizenry want? How are they responding to these things? And how do we create things that ensures that citizen gets what they need in order to participate in government? But it was that. So it's certainly the citizenry, it was startups, it was tech companies, it was international organizations, donors even. And there was just such a multifaceted buy-in into this is the journey that we're taking together. Inclusion. And by inclusion here, I'm speaking about digital inclusion. So for, for the people in the audience that are part of the digital uh, transformation, shall I call it, ecosystem, the one scary thing is that digital divide, is to what extent are you going to increase that digital divide if you go digital? Digital literacy, which is also an aspect uh, uh, Catherine Luello covered this morning. How do you get these things together? And as part of SWAT Rwanda, digital inclusion by design was part of the paradigm, not a bolt-on, not a, oh, we better think about this because we're losing half of our citizenry, is how do we ensure that that digital divide does not increase, but that it shrinks as part of this journey. And briefly, I mentioned policy integration. It wasn't about policy. And then afterwards, okay, let's figure out where digital comes in. Digital and policy almost seem to be the same animal. It is consistent. It is built in. It is just part of the thinking. The word I use is digital by design. So that is my takeaway. Someone else may find a different set of things that make the Rwanda case special. Um, but this was conversations I had and what I've tried to summarize. And I think it's a pretty convincing case about what makes a difference. And it wasn't that they were happening one at a time. These things were happening simultaneously across that journey. Regional impact. So it wasn't just little Rwanda in the middle there doing its thing. It had a significant regional impact. And briefly speaking, the one is it encouraged the um, a, a digitalization of neighboring countries, in one case by what is known as the One Area Network, which eliminates roaming costs for, 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 for mobile phone charges. And the other, other one is the East African e-passport e for that EAC that allows uh, citizens to cross borders just using that single digital passport as just some examples of its regional influence of its digital growth and performance. So as a benchmark, there's two things. The one is just broadly speaking, and it's useful to use the word benchmark here because there's rankings. Um, and what was interesting is the first thing is Rwanda is one of only three countries in the world with majority female parliament, the other two being Cuba and Bolivia. And there's a couple of others. I'm running out of time. So let me run through a couple of things here. The last point, the 2019 World Bank Doing Business Index. index. Canada ranks 23rd. Rwanda's right up there, 29th. I think there are 194 countries in the uh, member countries in the United Nations, just to give an idea of the relative ranking of Rwanda uh, in, in the scheme of just the, the ease of doing business index. I want to speak more about some of the digital transformation benchmarks. And in fact, it was Christopher that raised this point with me about e-waste. And in fact, Rwanda is only one of 13 African countries that have e-waste legislation. So we're speaking a lot about 
uh, um, uh, uh, electric, uh, uh, electric vehicles and electric trucks and all these kinds of things. But then another problem is emerging. What happens to all of that e-waste? So how is that going to be managed before it becomes a problem? Um, we, uh, I mean, you've got chatbots in healthcare. You've got two, Rwanda as a poor country. And in fact, my GDP is 171st of 194 UN member countries by GDP at uh, per capita, not at PPP, per capita, just to give you an idea. It's launched two satellites, one for, uh, for, for telecommunications and another to enable fast internet for rural schools so that rural schools even have access to fast internet. There's the whole issue, and that's why that whole national discourse things come up. Innovative technology inspires Rwanda to dream of made in Africa. Uh, there's, a, there's something, um, I mean, you may hear from the accent, I was born in Southern Africa. There's a big thing about African solutions for African problems. I can't speak for Rwanda for that. I haven't tested that past them, but I'm very aware of that kind of paradigm. But look at the last one. African smart city pioneer. In 2016, buses had free Wi-Fi and cashless payment, 2016. I have not caught a bus in the GTA or anywhere in Canada where I get Wi-Fi, whether I need to pay for it or not. Uh, just as some examples of the journey towards digital in Rwanda. So far, doing well for time. And what I would like to do right now, Christopher, if you're ready, is hand over to Christopher, who will take a little bit of a journey through how did we end up in Rwanda and what are we doing in healthcare? Excellent. Thank you, Christopher. Excellent. Thank you, Guy. And uh, as you may have heard, like I, I want to echo Guy's enthusiasm. It's just uh, Rwanda is a really a fascinating country. I get to travel the world relatively quite a bit. And it was my first trip uh, to join Guy a, a couple months ago in Rwanda. And I was struck by everything that he just talked about. Um, and just the level of development of this small nation in the middle of Africa, and after after you know the politics and the trauma that that, that we all many of us know um, from 1994. Um, but one example, I I I don't think I've ever been in a city that was that clean in Kigali, like a capital city that was spotless, absolutely spotless. Everybody was there, and that sort of demonstrates the level of leadership and pride that this nation has. And I think they, you see that as well in their digital transformation. On to the next slide. So my name is Christopher Yeomans. I'm the, I'm the project director for TAP EDM, and it is a the technical assistance partnership. It is an expert deployment mechanism, um, which essentially is uh, where we... Um, funded by Global Affairs Canada, so the Government of Canada, we get asks and we are asked by the diplomatic missions or the embassies around the world to, um, to, to, to send Canadians overseas and work with national government entities or you know, ministries and that sort of thing to help develop their capacity, help strengthen their institutional and, and their individual capacity as, as, as public servants in the work that they do. So we we these are from three months, two months to 12 months tops. And we are currently uh, on a program that's about a four year cycle or it's around $20 million. Next slide, please. So there's a real emphasis on trying to share our greatest resource, which are its people here from Canada. So we, uh, we, we strengthen national policies and programs, we increase institutional performance, public service accountability and capacity, we develop inclusive and more sustainable ways of thinking and doing the, the business of government. government. And uh, so we are, we're, we're, we're a bit all over the place. There you see a photo of one of our young uh, female uh, experts that we sent from, she's from, Southern Ontario that we sent to the Gambia to work with the Ministry of Justice on sexual and sexual and gender based violence, big issue in many, many countries. The next, please. The next slide. And, you know, this is this is an area where, um, you know, there's there's quite a bit of experience in applying different methods to really touch on such a complex problem. So right now we have 57 initiatives in 36 countries. That's a lot. We uh, are all over Asia. 
uh, Latin America, um, presence in the Caribbean, and then of course in Africa and the Middle East. We are you know, really part of implementing fem the Feminist International Assistance Policy by the government of Canada, which is really promoting gender equality and empowering women and girls around the world. And you know, through these actions, we're able to sort of respond to the needs of countries around the world. So there's another initiative, the anti-corruption initiative that we had with the Ministry of Justice in Paraguay. Um, and their unit that's looking at that issue, big issue around the world. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, what we're trying to do then is, is kind of twofold with this, this, this program. First, we respond to the needs of countries that are able to receive official development assistance. And this is OECD sort of list of uh, about 135 countries that we could send these experts to. Um, we're also engaging um, Canadians from across the country, and Guy is representative of that. Um, this is kind of his first foray in the international development field, um, but as an expert in his area, and also as a new arrival to Canada. Well, not that, not so new anymore, but um, as he mentioned before, Guy is born on the African continent um, and came to Canada, what, 20 years ago or so. Um, really showcasing Canadian values and Canadian um, know-how and experience and sharing that as we step forward and try to accompany our partners abroad. We also provide a little bit of visibility to Canada's assistance efforts and, and really strengthening that bilateral relationship between Canada and countries like Eswatini, in this case, Fiona there, who worked with the cooperatives in Eswatini. Next slide, please. So, so those are some of the key objectives. So in Rwanda, we work with the Ministry of Health, as mentioned, um, really to strengthen that country's health data systems and the service delivery around this. This is part of their national strategy for transformation. The one that was mentioned so eloquently by Guy in terms of how um, the, 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 the real coordinated approach um, um, that the government of Rwanda has been applying. And this, this strategy goes up until 2024, which is next year, and it's really focused on that social and economic transformation with um, that, that, you know, with a focus on the private sector. And I saw that as well in terms of the young people engaged in the creative arts and applying that. And so we were able to get someone so motivated like Guy Pierce, who's been working now for a number of months to develop a governance framework for healthcare. For, for health data sharing, ensure the protection, appropriate use of very sensitive information. There is a photo of, of, of him and, uh, and our government partners in the Ministry of Health. That was, yeah, not too long ago, a couple of months ago. Next slide, please. So what are some of the challenges that we see in terms of, um, you know, really implementing a, a, you know, and this focus, and we, you know, we've been assisted by this, all of us who have been affected by um, COVID and, and by the, the global pandemic of trying to move many of our services to a virtual environment and, and really um, the digital side of things. And so some of the challenges that we see right across the world are the interoperability, the ability to sort of seamlessly go from one healthcare data set to others and, and throughout the system. There's always been a problem, particularly with this type of sensitive information of privacy and security. So protecting a patient's privacy and ensuring the security of data, of health data, including, you know, who sees it, who doesn't see it, you know, and that appropriateness of, of, of that. Data governance and management. So that's that's related to, to this in terms of data policies and standards, processes, roles, and responsibilities. The workflow integration of user adoption. So, you know, who, who you know, and this, I, mean, I was in fact out in Vancouver this last week, spending a lot of time in the healthcare system because of some ailing parents and really seeing how some things were being transferred and shared and others not. So the workflow of these new systems requiring changes in workflows and practices and, and, and who the end users and, and particularly that coordination between the different health teams that need to be sharing this type of information. And of course, the infrastructure, the infrastructure that we need and the connectivity that we need to be able to um, access and share in a reliable high-speed internet connectivity and access to electricity are, are all sort of fundamental things and success factors for this. 
So, um, you know, all of these were raised with us while we were in, in, in Rwanda. Next slide, please. And, you know, we're, we're really seeing, you know, here and we're focused in on some of the challenges um, here in, in, in Rwanda for us specifically are the integration, the infrastructure, interoperability in digital liter literacy and the technical skills. And then more of a strategic response to, you know, these sort of four levels of alignment, the strategic alignment between the Ministry of Health strategy, their IT strategy, the data strategy with the Ministry of Health, ensuring that the architecture or the structure of, you know, their systems of, the, you know, the, the enterprise architecture, the IT architecture and the data architecture are, you know, able to support um, you know, this transformation of digital health. And then finally, that it's operational, you know, and that the operational systems are able to also adapt and implement. And so um, we've been focusing on these areas. And this is what Guy has really identified in terms of ensuring. And this is not easy stuff. In Canada, we've had a lot of difficulties in terms of applying this. And he'll give you more examples about that further. But IT and data governance is also um, certainly a, an important aspect of the work that Guy has been focused on in us in providing this technical assistance and, you know, actually building the capacity of the of the team that's responsible for this transformation within the Ministry of Health. Next slide, please. So um, in Canada, we see some of these, you know, and we we heard not too long ago in, in our transformation over the last decade or so, sort of the money that goes into this transformation and, and, and digitalizing our health data systems. And, and uh, you know, we've seen some, some, some problems and lots of hiccups with this, sort of seeing how that's moving forward, although it is. And then, of course, you know, the, the whole issue around um, patients who are at risk, and we've heard this, in fact, um, some breaches of the security systems in, in terms of healthcare data, and that's become a problem as well. So we, and these are, these are, the, these are the types of issues that, that are not resolved when you don't have that, that sort of harmony and, 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 and that integration of these different interoperability um, and, uh, and alignment between the strategic and the operational and the structure of, of the healthcare system data systems. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, this is, this is, this is kind of, you know, how we are um, in Canada able to sort of leverage some of the learning that we've had in, in implementing, a, you know, uh, um, and digitalizing our healthcare system, which we're still learning. And I think in some ways, you know, countries that picked up um, that type of, of, of technology have actually picked it up quicker. And I see that in many places when I go around the world, I see you know, how, how, how cell phones have been, been used to pay for your bill or to move things um, and, and the communications uh, you know, through, through, through mobile phones, et cetera, and mobile banking, et cetera. They, they've really taken, picked that up. Now we're, we're, we're able to harness some of the experience that, Gar, that Guy brings in terms of bringing that, that experience and really sharing some Canadian values around accountability. And this is important when you're working with, not, with you know, the, the state in terms of the sector and, and, uh, and working on um, transparency, working on governance structures that make sense and that are relatively efficient as well. And you know we've also learned from many of the challenges that we've had. So this is a real opportunity for for us to share some of those resources and and help build capacity in accompanying the Rwandans. And we're not really coming down there to tell them what to do. We're sort of accompanying them in a process, and they're identifying with us so that they really take. And, and Guy mentioned this before in terms of that whole approach to local ownership is extremely important. So they're identifying what the problems are and we're sort of working through with them. So yeah, I, I think these are not unique um, problems that we've seen in Rwanda and, and uh, you know, in, in us moving forward and, and, and trying to apply all these different international standards like the TOGAF and the ISOs. And, and these are really, um, important as we move forward and we create some standards and share some ways of, of, of doing and governing and managing um, in the healthcare digitalization process. Next slide, I think it's uh, coming back to you, Guy. Thank you, Christopher. 
Right, so as we start getting to the end of the presentation, so what do we extract as lessons for Canada? So just a few, I mean, there's probably many. The first is just the focus and that multidimensional engagement with a citizenry, with a startup ecosystem, technical partners, international partners, was certainly quite an experience. And you see some of it in Canada, and maybe there's a lesson that, you know, should it be more widespread could be a question or a conversation. Um, the second thing, global benchmark digital achievements don't need deep pockets if they're focused. And listening to Catherine Luello again this morning, she mentioned the IT budget for the government of Canada at 8.9 billion in 2021-2022. If I told you that that was pretty much the size of Rwanda's entire GDP, I think that begins to set things in context. The other thing that set things in context financially is the Auditor General's annual report is always a scary thing to read when it comes to wasteful and what does it call it? Wasteful and extraordinary expenditure. I can't remember what the exact word is. When you look at the scale of what falls in that in that category in the Auditor General's report, um, it exceeds Rwanda's GDP two or three times annually. So the question here is, and again, Catherine Luella raised this this morning about efficiency. There is a conversation efficiency. How can we be more careful about our approach to digital transformation, uh, more structured, more strategic perhaps? And it's not to say that you get it right all the time, but certainly, as I said, the Auditor General keeps raising just the extraordinary amount of money that you know, could have been perhaps, arguably, uh, uh, and not as wasteful or maybe not as extraordinary as, 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 as would be make out. And it's just about that focus and it's not necessarily about deep pockets. When you listen to the amount of expenditure on some digital projects in Canada compared to what you, know, you see, it's like, it's, it's extraordinary money. Digital inclusion by design is just, it's just beauty. It's just almost art. If you're, a, if you're an IT nerd, I mean, that's art. Digital inclusion by design, digital by design, digital integration into policy by design are just, it's just beautiful when you've got that harmony and that harmonious approach to achieving good outcomes for citizens. I spoke a bit about government performance measurement, and this is where I think Rwanda may be, be onto something. So there's something called Imihigo, uh, which means to vow to deliver, and every year government ministers basically vow to the president about what they're going to deliver, and they have to deliver. Uh, one of the things is determined to overcome any possible challenges, but it's measurable, and the big thing is about competition between ministers, as you saw, it was pillars. Everyone is going in the same direction, trying to achieve similar things. There is competition between ministries about how well, how efficient, how quickly, how well it's adopted, nature of digital literacy. All of these things are a fundamental part of the performance paradigm in Rwanda, which I found pretty extraordinary. And maybe that's also potentially a subject for conversation within the government of, of Canada. Big thing about measuring social outcomes, but the other interesting was self-governing and decentralized accountabilities and the models that have been put in place to ensure that there is decentralized accountability and it's almost self-governing. It's, it's a fascinating thing to see. Maybe there are examples in Canada. I'd be happy for anyone to, to, to speak about them if they are, but it was quite extraordinary to see. So in conclusion, let's answer the question. So is it a reference point? Well, measurably improved social outcomes, increasing global rankings. I would argue, or we would argue, if I may say, for sure. Uh, remarkable achievements. I would like to speak to anyone that says that is not a set of remarkable achievements for such a tiny country with such limited resources coming out the human tragedy as recently as it did. Does it inspire within Rwanda? The Made in Africa message is big. You can see it. And per the other uh, quote, it's part of the national discourse. There is inspiration around it. Does it provide valuable insights for other nations? So certainly regionally, as you saw, the regional countries, South Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, have all been inspired by the performance in Rwanda. I, I certainly want to put the argument for, I believe Canada should be inspired by what's going on in Rwanda too. 
With that said, that is the end of the presentation. Um, Global Affairs would love your feedback if you don't mind, if you are able, if you wouldn't mind uh, clicking on that QR link. I think there's four questions. They, um, as, as, as Christopher said, Global Affairs funds, um, well, this initi initiative and others, and they'd love to, to know whether you found there was value or what your opinions were in this respect. With that said, um, uh, Dr. Weissman, if I may hand back to you for Q&A. Well, so interesting. I didn't want you to hand back. I was just listening. <laughs> Glued to the presentation, I think is absolutely excellent. So, um, well, that's wonderful. Uh, any questions? Just go to the Q&A uh, Q box for any questions. Or, or do we unmute some people? <laughs> oh, I, I can't unmute everybody, but uh, but anyways, whatever. Listen, uh, I thought it, well, the depth of uh, research that you've done for this particular project has been uh, has been wonderful. Um, is there anything that people in government can do to help you, or the professional associations or academia, to basically help you with the technical assistance teams, Christopher? Um, well, I mean, in part for us, um, I mean, yes, we, we are constantly looking for expertise. And so it's good. I would encourage people to take a look at the website. I mean, we, we do look for people outside of this specific sector, but this sector is important. We've got a few other digital, um, projects where we are working on, for instance, a lot of data collection around and how important it is to understand how to collect the data in a sensitive sort of gender specific and sensitive way using the intersectional approach. Now we have a few that where we're doing this or, you know, just being able to use um, the digital transformation in terms of building capacity. And so we're often, you know, um, developing systems that really help us do that you know and and so yeah i mean one way is is just to get the word out there <laughs> that we we often are looking for experts in this field and others to send around the world and work with us and so part of the reason why we're here today is to sort of speak to this community in particular so i we really appreciate actually for uh dr weissman uh the opportunity to do so well thank you very much for speaking i think it's been an eye-opener and it's it's a delightful eye-opener we don't uh the media has, when it talks about certain countries, is it's it's never when anything is going super right. It's always when things are going wrong, and um, I think it's good that we basically can see as when there's a will, there's a way, and this is what the government has. And the previous presentations were very much focused on. You're not just changing the technology; you, you're basically changing the way business is done. A second, we actually have a question. Here we go. Okay. Uh, well, there was one question. How did Rwanda grow their GDP that rapidly? So on the one hand, oh. I would uh, certainly like to argue that there is a relationship between the digital enablement across those eight mm -hmm. or ten sectors of government that facilitated that conversation, certainly. Um, I'm not really sure what attributes exactly but I can say that there is a drive to shift from the focus, which is currently predominantly uh, um, agriculture and tourism, and to ensure, in their own words, on one of the slides, the more high value digital outcomes as a means of facilitating digital growth. So it, uh, it, I'm, I'm glad that question has emerged. It was, it's certainly eye opening. There's a relationship somehow. I don't know all of the dynamics behind exactly how it all works but those are the numbers it'd be a good research question it would yes. first. It, no well, no i'm sorry i'm serious it would be a good research question and um uh you know for countries that are if there's a will there's a way and they can there, there is benefit a definite benefit to it uh we had another question as you showed that uh, slide with the um house on, on multiple pillars yes um how do you make sure that uh, what they're that they're moving forward in competition, <laughs> but at the same time coherently? 
so yeah, couldn't speak on behalf of the government. And the only thing that maybe I could say is that because those performance measures are aligned as part of that competition and okay. why it's so important that it is a competition and that it is a vow to use the words on Rwanda's own website that was there, because if one pillar fails, it's going to hold all of the dependent pillars behind. So there's no opportunity for underperformance in a pillar or I didn't feel well that year or whatever it might be. It is a matter of, and in fact, that is the sense we got from the Ministry of Health is there's such pressure to perform, probably not only for their own pillar, but because there's dependencies. And if you don't perform in one area, you're going to constrain the performance of other areas. And I think that is certainly has to be a driver of ensuring that there's alignment because it's a team effort. It is a team across government. It is not silos. It's not, hey, I'm you know minister of this. It's mine. It is, hey, we're a single government of a single country. We are dependent on each other to achieve these outcomes. Are there any Go ahead. Yeah, if I may as well, I, you know, it's a bit of a, the, the, the elephant in the room, though. I, I think, you know, there was a good question as well at the beginning, and I think you, 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 you answered it, Dr. Weissman, but, you know, the fact that it is a small, resource-rich country and resource as well by the human resource that they have there, and it was traumatically impacted. I mean, the trauma of, you know, the genocide of its people um, and and of the Tutsis, you know, you the the as 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 stated by the government, and that's sort of their official way of stating it, um, you know, and and the reaction of the society really was to pull up and try to coalesce around a national unity, and you know, small country as it is. It's very rich in terms of its resources, and they're you know they're well coordinated. You can tell, and and I think that question around sort of the multiple stakeholders is is true, and there there seems to be a high level of engagement, at least from what I saw, guy, yes. a high level of engagement with civil society actors, which is really important. You can't government cannot do this alone. It needs private sector. It needs civil society to hold to hold it as well, and. In few countries have I seen a people that was so behind a president that's been in power for over a couple of decades, right? Are we talking a couple of decades? 2003, so 20 years now. Yeah, yeah, that is just phenomenal. And like, I mean, maybe there were things I wasn't seeing, but I mean, there's a there was a certain level of of national pride that really, and you see it. I mean, I came from Nairobi to Kigali and the development's different and it's a richer country right there's more money in that country but it didn't have the same level of of sort of national unity and pride and just organization that you would see in a, in a country like this so it really is a story that guy put piece together that is really interesting and i agree with you dr weissman be a good case study yeah it'd be a good case study i'm sorry i just uh it's not that i didn't want size is definitely a factor but um, you know it's the the will, and that was uh, that question about size was talked about with respect to technology infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, you're taking a country. We had a case study this morning from uh, Ukraine, mm -hmm. and you know, like I said, physical infrastructure is becoming. You know, the satellites are there. You don't. You know, you, you wiring is not necessary. You know what I mean? So as a consequence, there is a, there's going to be, there's a revolution in many parts of the digital technology spectrum. But uh, I agree, having a small country, take a look at Singapore, take a look mm -hmm. at Taiwan, take a look at some of the other countries. Mind you, some of them are not that small, but still, nonetheless, they're moving ahead at a great rate of knots because they have the will. Um, I know in Malaysia, like, you know, Kuala Lumpur, it was, the question was not why not it was let's do it you know what i mean uh, you know there were there were no there was such a will to move forward and also to manage risk to understand risk is there life's that life's like that let's manage it and let's move on a uh, will to implement uh, any other questions folks there we go sorry i didn't see anything else well listen i i, re I really thought that was fascinating um oops sorry just a sec i think there's another question here uh, no, sorry, I apologize. Okay, yeah. go ahead. 
Well, I just want to say, like, I mean, it's it's people like you all that are online and, and others. I mean, we're really able to share. People are looking for Canada in the world. And this this is the type of thing where, you mm -hmm. know, they're looking for Canadian leadership and Canadian values because people know it's kind of an interesting place that is a peaceful place that is relatively developed, et cetera. And so this is the type, you know, what Guy is doing in Rwanda is really the type of thing that we're able to do and, and that people are looking for. And so appreciate this space, um, Dr. Weissman, to, uh, to share that with all of you. And yeah, look it up. You might uh, be uh, eligible to apply for, for this type of work in the future. Well, no, that would be great. Uh, I spent 30 years in government and I, I did a lot of traveling, you know, so I, I've traveled all over the world with uh, open standards. I've got a question here, just sort of this just came in. What can Canada learn and apply immediately from a small country like Rwanda? So what I hope is those lessons learned are exactly what I would feel are key lessons right now. Um, I mean, the nature of performance measurement, uh, watching out, that uh, you don't increase the digital divide in your digital journey, uh, making sure that policy and digital are integrated from the start, not as bolt-on. As Christopher was mentioning as well, involve, involve the private sector, involve the citizens, citizenry, involve technical companies, involve international partners in part of the journey to get that buy-in, to get that momentum, to build the thing. So that entire slide, I believe, is a, certainly a starting block for the kinds of things that we could learn. But I want to build on something that Christopher also said, that passion and that pride and the nature of the of the national discourse, that unity. You know, you as Christopher said, I'm going to say you feel it. It's not like you come in and everyone feels oh, I'm part of this group or that group or that. that sense of unity, the pride, the wanting to talk about Rwanda, but being held back because they feel they're behind and because there's so much to do. It is really just that sense of national unity and pride in the digital journey. And what Rwanda has become is, I mean, I think there's there's a conversation for Canada there. I, yeah. I, I certainly would believe. Yeah, and, and, and Guy had worked, just one last plug. I mean, Guy had worked with First Nations across this country. And we are involved in a, in a process of reconciliation around, among cultures, et cetera, and different groups that have been disadvantaged by the systems in place in this country. I take away from the Rwandans that resilience after a very traumatic you know, social upheaval mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago now. And you know, like we could learn from that, as you were alluding to, Guy. And, and I think, um, yeah, that's, that's one of my takeaways from that. that uh, how, how resilient we can be if we really set our minds to it and we really work on it all as a nation or a multiple nations, you know. Yeah. And the, the ability to execute. Well, yes. ever so, Guy and Christopher, thank you ever so much for taking the time to present this case study. It's been I, I found it absolutely fascinating. And um, for all the audience, on behalf of everybody, thank you. And um, Hope to, that you are finding some of the other presentations useful within this uh, within this conference, useful or interesting. I think might my, my, my might be a way, and I find a lot of this has been presented has been quite motivational. Right, and countries that have been able to move forward and do the digital journey and and not consume an absolute mountain of resources. It's basically okay. organization, willpower, and um, and getting on with it, and 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 collaboration. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris and Guy. Um, I'll just do a quick plug for tomorrow's sessions, and then we'll wrap her up. We've had a great day today, the day one of the conference. A couple of hiccups, but that's that's the way life is. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to start off with a uh, presentation by India Rail. And remember, railways in India are the responsibility of the government. And uh, they're going to be talking about uh, how they're transforming it using architectural techniques. And remember that India Rail moves 8 billion people and 1,400 1, million tons of freight along 128,000 kilometers of track annually. It is a huge operation. And the infrastructure is showing its age and processes and the like. That's gonna be followed off. And then we have Dr. Jay Leibovitz. He's from Tufts University. He's gonna be talking about expanding the digital talent pipeline in the US government. Um, he's a gifted author 
and um, uh, he's also working out of the Columbia uh, School of Data Sciences. Anyways, he'll be giving a, a very interesting, and that's forming the HR aspect, the people aspect of digital transformation. Then at 1010, we've got Ott Velsberg. He's from the government of Estonia, the chief data officer, and he's talking about building a data-driven government, lessons learned from Estonia's journey. And that's another example of a small country that's moved ahead at a very rapid rate. And remember, they, they didn't have the strategic uh, uh, conflict that they had in Rwanda, but they, they just emerged from a different, shall we say, political paradigm in, in the 90s, and they've moved very rapidly. Uh, in that area. That's going to be followed by Ima Okani, and she's the Chief Data Officer for Employment and Social Development Canada, and she's going to be talking about how do you manage data in a large government department. Um, data is a core resource. How do you handle that? After lunch, we're going to be having Julie Champagne, the Bank of Canada, and she's also the Chief Data Officer, and she's going to be talking about the Chief Data, of, uh, Chief data Officer leadership role in digital transformation. Uh, it'll be a fascinating uh, presentation. And that's going to be followed by Eric Sweden. He's from the National Association of State CIOs. And he's going to be talking about state IMIT priorities for digital transformation. And what he does, he does a survey of the 50 states um, uh, through the association. And they basically share lessons learned between the 50 states. And it's a very effective uh, organization. And they basically make sure that lessons learned are shared. Then we have a stream on uh, global digital transformation, and uh, we're very happy to, uh, lucky to have Dr. James Denford's going to be speaking. He's from the Royal Military College of Canada, and he's going to be talking about a global assessment of national artificial intelligence policies. He's done a survey of some 34 nations. So that'll be quite interesting and in saying is, let's get away from the technology. Let's find out what's happening. Um, we've got Den Denis Suzar from the United Nations. And he'll be talking about the methodology for e-government. Every two years, uh, they come out with an e-government survey, and they survey hundreds of countries, and they figure out, uh, they come out with a, a quadrant and a measure uh, to, to basically state how well their digital journey is going. Um, in this in the government design innovation, we're going to have Dr. Stenio Fernandez from uh, the Bank of Canada. He's going to be talking about digital transformation and innovation value streams. And this is the way that they're modeling their, their data environment and the like. And then we're going to have uh, Sahar Nizami Tafreshi, and she's the Senior Director for Analytics and Insights at the Bank of Canada. She's going to be talking about establishing an analytic strategy in practice. That's also going to be followed by Dorothy Eng. She's the Executive Director uh, for Code for Canada. And she's talking about technology and design for the public good. Uh, for that, this is a, a, a Toronto-based not non-government organization, and she's helping governments move forward. And then we get Eric Baladas, who's going to be, he's a director of analytics and decision support at the Bank of Canada, and he'll be talking about data fluency at the Bank of Canada, a learner-centric approach. And I know certainly as an academic teaching both grad and undergrad students, um, I'm, I'm going to be very interested on what construes data literacy and data fluency and the like. So I want to thank you all very much for having attended this course. I hope that uh, there were a lot of insights gathered. And uh, if you have any questions, I don't see any. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the day and find that this has been a useful uh, expenditure of your time. So I'll see you tomorrow. We start at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the first ones up are going to be the Indians who are going to meet. And it's going to be about 9 o'clock in the evening their time. So we're very happy to, very lucky to have their presentation. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I conclude this session. Oops, sorry, we got questions here. Good.